Hello everyone! This is the difference of Gaussians. 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 Effective edge detection is a never-ending area of research, and something I have talked about extensively in most of my videos. So far, I have talked about the Sobel operator, the canny edge detector, the inverse hole method, and edge detection through depth and normal difference, but many more exist. All of these methods look distinctly different and have their own benefits and drawbacks. For instance, the canny edge detector is one of the most widely used and popular edge detection methods, but it requires fine-tuning on a per-image basis, so it's not fit for real-time rendering. Also, it looks like shit. But what if I told you that we could get effective, aesthetically pleasing edge detection by just blurring an image twice? Take this image as an example. If we apply a Gaussian blur with any standard deviation, then we have very effectively blurred the image. Next, let's take the original image again and apply a separate Gaussian blur with a scalar on the first deviation. This gives us two blurred images where one is more blurred than the other. Now, what were to happen if we subtracted these two images from each other. Oh my god. Edge lines. We can further accentuate and solidify these lines by applying a threshold to the output, where anything greater than the threshold is white and everything else is black. This operator is known as the difference of Gaussians, and when compared to canny edge detection, we see that we get a similar output but debatably more pleasing visuals, such as varying line width. But how is it even possible that the difference of two Gaussian blurs results in effective edge detection? In signal processing, the Gaussian function is what's known as a low-pass filter, meaning that given a signal, high frequencies will be suppressed, while the lower frequencies are left alone. This suppression is determined determined by the standard deviation of the Gaussian function, and since we have two Gaussian filters being applied with differing deviations subtracted from each other, we end up with a bandpass filter that only lets select frequencies through. Conveniently, these frequencies tend to be areas of high contrast, which usually corresponds to edges. Obviously, this output is a far cry from the visuals I showed at the beginning of the video, but the groundwork is there. It wasn't until 2012 when Hyogre Windmuller and their team recognized this potential and proposed a very simple extension to the difference of Gaussians that unlocked its infinite potential. Windmuller sought to add as much artistic control to the operator as was possible, starting with a simple scalar on the second Gaussian, which allows for a much wider range of possible outputs already. This change was coupled with a modification to the binary thresholding function from earlier in which anything below the threshold is now ran through a parameter parameterized hyperbolic tangent function, instead of being strictly black. These changes have already majorly improved the difference of Gaussians, but unfortunately, this version of the operator is very finicky. When tau increases, the average brightness of the output decreases, but the only way to emphasize edge lines is to increase tau, requiring us to compensate for this change in brightness by making changes to the other parameters. Windmuller, unhappy with these interwoven parameter dependencies, rewrote the difference of Gaussians operator such that the smaller Gaussians scales along with the larger Gaussian. This very simple change allows us to sharpen the output without any change in brightness. Thus was born the extended difference of Gaussian's operator, the true foundation of everything. While this is technically all we need in order to start stylizing images, there's still one major improvement we need to make. Windmuller solved the sharpness dilemma, but there's still one big problem with the effect. When we increase the sharpness on some images, it becomes very obvious just how much the output is affected by noise, 
making it sometimes impossible to bring out edges without also accentuating the noise. It turns out that we can apply the same theory from the anisotropic Kuwahara filter in which we utilize the edge tangent flow of the image to calculate our difference of Gaussians. As a quick recap, the edge tangent flow of the image is calculated by convolving the image with the Sobel operator such that we approximate the partial derivatives of the image, which we then use to create a structure tensor. This is where our next parameter of the effect is introduced. We want to Gaussian blur the structure tensor, but depending Depending on how much we blur it, we can get different styles. The standard deviation of the structure tensor blur will be referred to as sigma c. After blurring, we construct the eigenvector that points in the direction of least change and we have a map of the edge tangent flow. We can then use this map when we calculate our two Gaussian blurs, but now, instead of Gaussian blurring the whole image, we only need to do a one-dimensional blur across the edges. The standard deviation of this Gaussian blur will be referred to as sigma e. After doing our two one-dimensional blurs, we calculate the difference of Gaussians using the extended operator from earlier, but this alone is not enough to reduce the impact of the noise. What we want to do next is smooth the output with an edge-aligned blur. But how can we blur along edge lines? The edge tangent flow is what's known as a vector flow field, where the vectors point in the direction of edge lines. So far, we have only used this information on a single pixel basis, but we can actually travel along the flow field if we desire. We start by sampling our center pixel along with its corresponding vector in the flow field. We calculate the Gaussian with a standard deviation that we will refer to as sigma m, and then we shift our UV coordinates by the vector, repeating this process until we exceed the kernel size of our Gaussian blur. Then, we do the same thing, but in the opposite direction. This process is known as line integral convolution and is a fairly common technique in the world of image processing for visualizing flow fields. Applying the edge-aligned blur to our difference of Gaussians term, we get a much smoother output than our original difference of Gaussians render, where we can sharpen edges more without as much impact from noise. If we take a look at our thresholded difference of Gaussians, we can see lots of yucky aliasing all over the place. But it turns out we can very easily anti-alias this by doing a second line integral convolution to smooth out those jagged edges. The standard deviation of that blur will be referred to as sigma a, and it makes quite a big difference. This marks the completion of our difference of Gaussians algorithm, but how do we get it to look as cool as possible? With so many parameters, the effect is quite daunting, but I'd like to see just how detailed of an output we can get. Also, for the sake of simplicity, I'll be referring to the difference of Gaussians as the dog from here on. A very low standard deviation on the blurring of the image itself lets us capture very fine details, even tiny subtle features like the lower eyelashes. We can bring out even more details by increasing the sharpness, which really helps define the hair. From here, the threshold settings will wildly change the output. With a higher white point, we can make it more dramatic and we can also reduce the strength of the hyperbolic curve to get a smoother gradient. This thresholding function is cool and all, but we can technically run the dog through any function we'd like. The hyperbolic tangent is fairly limited in that we can only get a two-tone result or a slight gradient, but what if we want more tones than just black and white? If we send the dog through the same quantization function from my video on pixel art, we can get any number of tones we want. Personally, I think the three-tone looks the best, if unaltered, but higher tone quantization pairs very well with one-bit dithering to give much more defined dither gradients. While Taylor Swift is very pretty, this is ultimately a pretty simple photo. How does the dog look on a more complex environment? Applying the dog to this photo with the same settings as our quantized Taylor Swift, the results aren't too great. The foliage close to the camera and the bridge look fine, but we can see that the dog has been reading way too much Junji Ito with those swirly artifacts in the distance. This is the fault of our edge tangent flow blur and subsequent line integral convolution smoothing. We can make the photo look much better by reducing the ETF blur to near zero, and the swirliness disappears, giving us a very nicely stylized image without any line integral convolution artifacts. But I find the contrast to be a bit too jarring in this render, so I think reducing 
doing it makes quite a big difference. I dogged a few more photos with a similar setup, and I think it's quite impressive how well the dog is able to preserve and stylize edges. But I can't shake off this feeling of regret for choosing high frequency image stylization in front of all of those parameters. If I had chosen some other path, I would have surely obtained a quite different style. Perhaps then I could have found what's known as that perfectly stylized image. This marks the completion of our difference of Gaussians algorithm, but how do we get it to look as cool as possible? With so many parameters, the effect is quite daunting, but what happens if we try to simplify the image? Also, for the sake of simplicity, I'll be referring to the difference of Gaussians as the dog from here on. A very high standard deviation on the blurring of the image itself makes edges wider and fine details are discarded, which becomes more obvious when we increase the sharpness. Just as an experiment, let's see what happens if we max the blur settings on all five blurs. Well, that looks terrible. But it does demonstrate how much the other settings can change the output. Returning back to normal, the blur of the structure tensor has a major impact, especially when it approaches zero. If we juxtapose this with a maximum line integral convolution blur, and a major increase in sharpness, we can then reduce the strength of our hyperbolic tangent thresholding, and we end up with a style that looks a lot like a rough charcoal sketch. Then, with only a small adjustment to our image blur and anti-aliasing, we get a more detailed but smoother style that looks a lot like a grayscale pastel. Black and white is cool and all, but what about coloring our image? A first approach might be to just multiply the dog with the original color buffer, which results in a very cartoonish style with hard shadows and dark edge lines. But to get a more painterly output, we can make use of a two-point interpolation, where we interpolate from black to the image color, and then from the image color to white, based on the dog term. This method of blending sort of simulates artistic use of white space, and while it doesn't look quite right yet, it looks a lot more natural once we blend it onto a texture such as paper. Color blending obviously unlocks multitudes more stylization options, but the big one for me is watercolor, which is one medium that generally takes advantage of large amounts of white space. To get there, we want to tone back the exaggerated line integral blending of the pastel style, as well as increase the image blurring to remove some details. Lastly, we want to use quantization thresholding for a much smoother gradient, and once we do our two-point interpolation color blending, we already see something that looks quite a lot like watercolor, especially when we blend it onto a watercolor paper texture. This isn't all we can do though. It turns out that the step size of our line integral convolutions can make make a considerable impact. On the anti-aliasing pass, if we multiply our step size by one fourth, then we can get more compacted gradients akin to watercolor paint blotches. On the contrary, if we multiply the step size by a number greater than one, then we can smear the image such that it looks like it was painted with a stipple brush. I dogged a few more photos with a similar setup, and I think it's quite impressive how well the dog is able to output a wide variety of painterly styles without any other effect combinations, but I can't shake off this feeling of regret for choosing painterly stylization in front of all of those image parameters. If I had chosen some other path, I could have surely obtained a quite different style. Perhaps then I could have found what's known as the perfectly stylized image. This marks the completion of our difference of Gaussians algorithm, but how do we get it to look as cool as possible? Well, actually, I'd rather just play games instead. I've been playing a lot of Teamfight Tactics this year, and I'll be streaming my Challenger Climb over on Twitch. My end of the year goal for 2022 is 1,000 followers on all platforms, and I'm pretty close to my goal over there, so I'd really appreciate if you'd drop me a follow over there and catch me when I'm streaming live. Ace Rolla proceeded to quit his day job and stream TFT for 18 hours a day, seven days a week, to three viewers on average. He never made it to Challenger.
This marks the completion of our difference of Gaussians algorithm, but how do we get it to look as cool as possible? With so many parameters, the effect is quite daunting, but I'd like to see what the effect looks like in real time. Applying the effect to Final Fantasy XIV, the results are as you would expect. Since we are making use of the edge tangent flow of each frame, the effect is visually consistent in motion, but Unfortunately, the dog is riddled with flickering pixels. I have no real idea what's causing this problem, other than I know it has to do with the line integral convolutions, and it's only present on low-quality Final Fantasy XIV textures like zoomed-in armor and the skybox. We could fix this flickering with something like temporal anti-aliasing, which is what all modern games make use of anyways, but unfortunately, I can't demonstrate that for you because it is impossible in G-Shade, so you'll just have to trust me. Anyways, we can stylize Final Fantasy in all the ways we know how. Detailed edges, charcoal, pastel, colored pastel, or watercolor, but my aspirations go beyond these petty, simple-minded attempts at stylization. What happens if we were to do something forbidden? Something unheard of? What if we were to apply a second dog pass? A double dog, as we say in the industry, allows us to further stylize the first dog output. This can be used to further simplify and remove more details, but my favorite use case is as a makeshift tone mapper. Since the dog naturally highlights contrast, if we don't do any thresholding on the second dog and then multiply it with the first dog, we can very nicely selectively increase the contrast of the render. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have much else to show for the double dog since, like, I only have so much time to test applications. But rather than two dog passes, what if we thresholded the dog multiple times? If we take a look at our dog output with a few increasing thresholds, we see more and more shading appear in each one. But how could we layer these in a meaningful way? Well, one art technique that takes advantage of layered, intersecting lines to add depth and form to illustration is known as crosshatching. If we find ourselves a crosshatch texture and use our thresholded dogs as a mask, we can then rotate the crosshatch uniquely across each layer and multiply them all together to create a crosshatched image. And lastly, we can blend it onto a paper texture to make it look a lot nicer. While this looks pretty cool, it's a little too clean. We can make use of the double dog technique here to very slightly blur the crosshatch and then blend it back into itself to add deeper shadows to the heavily crosshatched areas as well as a slight smudge to everything, which makes it look much more natural. Now, you might be asking yourself, Ace Rolla, what about colored pencil? And well, that's pretty easy. We can just use our crosshatched output as a mask for the original image. The output is really dull though, so we can heavily increase the saturation to make it look a lot more accurate to the medium. This crosshatching technique looks great in real time and hides the flickering problem of the dog quite well. An individual in my Discord server went through the process of perfecting the colored pencil side of things, which I think looks lovely. As usual, these shaders are freely available to play around with in the description. Stylized edge lines, triple toning, charcoal, pastel, watercolor, stipple brush, tone mapping, cross hatching, colored pencil. I'm starting to think that rather than expecting anything more, I should be happy with what I've got. But all I know is that this dog is one very good boy. I hope I've sufficiently demonstrated the sheer number of possible use cases for the difference of Gaussians. There's still so much more that could be done by extending the thresholding functions, the blending methods, or even the way we calculate the difference of Gaussians itself. I wish I had the time to discover even more ways to use the filter, but I'll take a break for now. If you have any ideas, please comment below, or at least tell me which style was your favorite. If you like my content and would like to have a say in what comes next, all of my patrons get to vote on my next video. The way it works is, I give you all a list of video titles and you vote on the one that you think sounds most interesting to you. It's kind of like the Stellaris tech tree. Anyways, that's all from me. As usual, a big thank you to all of my patrons helping me achieve my goal of full-time content creation. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you next time.